Chapter 12, Economic Cost of Lockdowns. As we all know, the economy took a large hit in 2020. It is often said that this was because of the pandemic. That, of course, is not true. It was because of the lockdown response, because of the COVID restrictions, not because of the disease itself. Our governments, not only in the United States, but around the world, knew the lockdowns would produce large economic damage, but they decided it was worth it to try to reduce COVID deaths. Was it worth it? Let's see how large the economic damage was. Most of us have been surprised the damage was not worse than it was. The U.S. stock market now, as of March 2021, is above where it started 2020. Total wages and salaries in nominal do dollar terms, though not in, in inflation-adjusted dollar terms, were slightly higher in the fourth quarter, Q4 of 2020, than they had been in Q1 of 2020. So in those senses, we have recovered completely. But we are well below where we would have been without, the, without lockdowns. And in Q2 and Q3 of 2020, we were certainly uh, far below where we would have been without lockdowns. Millions of people lost their jobs. Millions more saw their wages decline. Millions more lost retirement savings in the stock market and sold stocks at the wrong time during the trough. And millions of small business owners saw their businesses decline or fail. The table below shows the raw data on gross domestic product, GDP, and salaries and wages used to, used to make my calculations here. Source U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. The numbers in the table above are in nominal dollars, not inflation adjusted. From this table, GDP had increased by 3.98% from 2018 to 2019. That is right in line with the average 4.00% average annual increase for 2009 to 2019. So this was an average annual increase, and it is fair to project the same increase to 2020 if we had not had lockdowns. If GDP had risen again by 3.98% in 2020, we would have had a GDP of $22.286 billion, sorry, trillion dollars in 2020. Instead, we had a GDP of $20,934 billion in 2020, a deficit of $1,351 billion. I think nearly everyone would agree that entire deficit is due to the lockdowns. So the lockdowns cost the U.S. $1,351 billion in economic production in 2020, plus a little more for the first two quarters of 2021 that I will not include here. $1,351 billion divided by 328 million persons in the U.S. is an economic cost of $4,119 per person. Wages and salaries are another way to evaluate this. This is pay to employees. It does not include profit for business owners or corporate profits or government assistance payments or dividends or capital gains for individuals. Wages and salaries increased by 4.67% from 2018 to 2019. If they had increased by the same 4.67% in 2020, we would have had wages and salaries of $9,743 billion in 2020. Instead, instead of the $9,331 billion that we had. So workers lost the difference of $411 billion in 2020. We had about 159 million full and part-time employees in the United States in February 2020, before a fall to about 133 million in April, and a recovery to 151, 150 million by January 2020. If we use the 159 million workers immediately pre-lockdowns, the average annual wage in 2019 was $58,547. The median wage was $35,977 in 2019, reference two. Again, to refresh your memory, the average is the total of all wages divided by the number of workers, while the median is the figure at which 50% of workers made more and 50% made less. The lost total wages and earnings in 2020 of $411 billion due to the lockdowns divided by 159 million workers pre-lockdown is a loss of $2,590 per worker. This was disproportionately borne by the lower wage workers, those making less than $35,977, as shown by the fact that 26 million workers lost their jobs due to the lockdowns, chapter seven and reference three. So for those, their wages went to zero, at least for part of 2020. The $2,590 average lost wage would be 7.2% of the median wage or 4.4% of the average wage. I have estimated here that the lockdowns may have prevented 200,000 COVID deaths and at most prevented 400,000 COVID deaths because we would have been at herd immunity with 400,000 more COVID deaths. 
with the GDP loss of $1,351 billion divided by 200,000 COVID deaths averted, it was $6.75 million of GDP loss per person saved from COVID, or with an average life expectancy remaining of four years, $1.69 million per person year of life saved. By these calculations with the lockdown strategy, we spent $1.69 million to save one person year of life from COVID death. But it should be remembered that it is actually much worse than that. We spent $1.69 million in order to save one person year of life by preventing a COVID death, and in order to lose three person years of life by causing a suicide or a drug overdose. So it is a lose-lose proposition. We lost the money and the money went towards the cause of killing people on balance, not saving them. But let's pretend the lockdowns did not cause any suicides and assume they prevented 200,000 COVID deaths in the United States, as we have assumed. Is it worth $6.75 million to save one life? If it's your own life and you have $6.75 million to spare, yes, of course it's worth it. If it is anyone else's life and you have exactly $6.75 million in your bank account, probably not. If it is anyone else's life and you have $100 million in your bank account, yes, it would be nice if you were willing to pay $6.75 million to save that life, although I don't think you would be doing it two or three times. The U.S. government, for its cost-benefit analysis, uses a figure of $10 million as the value of saving one life. So by that metric, $6.75 million is worth it to save one life. But that $10 million is for a generic life, not for any particular age. The COVID dead die with an average of four years of life expectancy remaining had they not contracted COVID. I would say that we do not believe it is worth $1.69 million for one person year of life. The median person dying of COVID is 84 years old. If your 84-year-old father or mother dies due to medical malpractice or in a car accident or other wrongful death, and you sue for wrongful death, you are not going to get an award of $6.75 million. You probably would not get that if your teenage child dies due to negligence or medical malpractice. In Minnesota, we've had four well-publicized cases of police wrongfully killing civilians in recent years. Those four cases and two others from elsewhere are, and the dollar amounts awarded for each of these deaths were these. Justine Demond, 40-year-old white woman, shot by a policeman from the driver's seat of his squad car because she banged on his foot, hood for attention and startled him after she had phoned for police help because she had heard a woman scream. $20, bill, $20 million. Brianna Taylor, black woman, 26-year-old medical technician, shot six times by police in Louisville, Kentucky, in her bed in a wrongful drug raid. She had nothing to do with drugs and had done nothing wrong. $12 million. Philando Castillo, black man, 32 years old, pulled over in a traffic stop and shot and killed by the officer because the officer panicked after Castillo politely and calmly told the officer that he had a permit to carry a gun and had a gun in the car. $3 million to his family and $0.8 million in a separate settlement to his girlfriend. Jamar Clark, unarmed 24-year-old black man, killed by Minneapolis police when they stopped him for questioning for domestic abuse. The alleged abuse victim had not reported domestic abuse. She called 911 and said she had hurt her ankle and asked for an ambulance. The 911 operator argued with her that she was a, the victim of domestic abuse and instead of an, ac uh, instead of an accident and sent police, which the purported victim did not request. Jamar Clark was unarmed. In the video, it appears a first officer attacked him without provocation and wrestled Clark to the ground, and Clark defended himself by wrestling back before the first officer's partner standing nearby shot and killed Clark. $200,000. George Floyd, 46-year-old black man, stopped as a suspect for allegedly passing a counterfeit $20 bill at a grocery store. The police took him to the ground and kneeled on his neck for over nine minutes until he died by suffocation despite his telling the officers he could not breathe and many onlookers screaming at the officers that they were killing him. $27 million. Eric Garner, 43-year-old black man, killed by police in New York during a stop for suspicion of illegally selling cigarettes on the sidewalk. He was choked to death by an officer after telling him and other officers that he could not breathe. $5.9 million. None of the families of the young black men in these examples got $6.75 million, except for George Floyd, and his family only got it because his death triggered such national outrage. And these victims were all a lot younger than 84. The two women got more, and the white woman received the most, except for George Floyd. Our society obviously values white lives more than black lives. Perhaps less obviously, it can also be argued, it values women's lives more than men's. 
I asked a plaintiff's attorney in Minnesota what a typical award might be in a case of a clear-cut wrongful death due to medical malpractice or a traffic accident, and she said that for a victim in his 80s, the award would rarely reach $1 million. Surprisingly to me, she also said that $1 million would be almost as rare for a teenage victim. She said there was a case recently of three teenagers killed in a, car, in a train accident where each family got $6 million from the railroad, but there was an element of punitive damages included in that to punish the railroad, rather than merely to compensate for the deaths. And that is the largest recent award she is aware of. The same element of punitive damages applies to the settlements for police killings above. Each of those settlements includes money as punishment for wrongdoing or negligence by the cities involved, so the actual value of the life loss can be deemed to be less than the award size. Another, I think, interesting way to think about the monetary value of a person your year of life is to imagine that you are middle-aged and the only child of your parents, and your father has passed away. Your mother is still alive and in her 80s, and you love your mother and she loves you. You have almost no retirement savings. Would you rather have your mother live one year longer and have nothing to leave you, You have almost no retirement savings. Would you rather have your mother live one year longer and have nothing to leave you in inheritance or have her die one year earlier than she otherwise will die, whenever that will be, and leave you $1.69 million? Don't worry, you don't have to answer out loud. If you were the mother in that scenario, would you volunteer to die a year earlier if it meant you could leave $1.69 million to your child instead of zero? We do not, as a society, behave like we think a person's life is worth $6.75 million, and certainly not like we think one person's year of life is worth $1.69 million. I agree with that assessment. Just the financial cost of the lockdowns was not worth it to save the relatively small number of lives, almost all of them elderly, with little time left to live, that the lockdowns have saved and prevented COVID deaths, even if the lockdowns had not caused suicides and depression and the other human costs discussed in this book, and even if the economic cost had been more borne mostly by the well-off instead of being more borne mostly by poor people and middle-class people as it was. It should be remembered that this economic cost was borne mostly by the poor and middle class, not the rich. First, as mentioned above, total U.S. salaries, U.S. wages and salaries in Q4 of 2020 were narrowly above what they had been in Q4 of 2019 and Q1 of 2020. So in that sense, wages had recovered. But 26 million Americans lost their jobs in the lockdowns, and as of January 2021, there were still about 6 million fewer workers than there had been in February 2020. Those unemployed were disproportionately low-wage low workers, so clearly the lowest paid suffered the most, and the highest paid may have actually profited from the lockdowns. Billionaires as a group actually did profit from the lockdowns. The total net worth of billionaires in the U.S. was $3.0 trillion in February 2020, and now, in February 2021, it has grown to $4.3 trillion, an increase of a stunning 43% in one year. Reference 4. So this $6.75 million per COVID death averted was not paid by billionaires, it was paid to billionaires. And it was paid mostly by the poor and middle class. Addendum 2023, Inflation and Shortages. One of the harms we experienced that was caused by the lockdowns was product shortages, which then caused inflation. Almost immediately when the lockdowns were implemented, we began experiencing shortages and empty shelves. We ran out of toilet paper, chicken, eggs, meat in general, office paper, computer chips, new cars, and other goods. We had empty shelves in grocery stores for the first time in my life. Then with some delay, we had the worst inflation in 40 years. Inflation began in December 2020 and has continued at roughly the same rate into early 2023. I believe the inflation was not really inflation, though. It was shortages. Wages did not go up. People did not start charging more for services, for the most part. Just the price of goods, especially food, went up. So I think it was really shortages, not inflation. Goods became in short supply, so the producers and retailers needed to charge more and could charge more. Yes, the government printed money hand over fist during the lockdowns, but it had been doing that for 40 years and it did not cause inflation. So I don't think it was that more money was chasing the same amount of goods. Rather, it was that the same amount of money was chasing fewer goods. Ordinarily, you would blame Congress and Federal Reserve for inflation, but in this case, it was not inflation but shortages, and the people to blame were Anthony Fauci and your state's governor for implementing lockdowns. <laughs>